domesticated horse has been a major contributor to human development throughout history and across cultures. But exactly when and where did horses become domesticated? The answer isn't as clear cut as you'd think. In 2012, scientist Alessandro Achille set out to expand our understanding of how horses came to be domesticated by conducting a phylogenetic analysis on 83 horse mitochondrial genomes collected from across Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. His results give us a better picture of when and where this evolutionary split occurred. To start, it's worth explaining why we focus on mitochondrial DNA when trying to trace evolutionary history. Mitochondria, crucially, possess their own genome, distinct from the larger organism's genome. Additionally, as early studies on horse lineages dated as far back as 1974 reveal, in successive generations of horses, almost all the mitochondrial DNA came directly from the mother, with very little parental recombination. This has two significant implications. Firstly, it means we can trace a straight, matriarchal line through generations of horses. Secondly, since mitochondrial DNA isn't being recombined between two parents, almost all genetic variation occurs through spontaneous substitution mutations, which are simpler than genetic recombination to track. In his work, Achille identified a critical bottleneck in horse phylogeny studies up to this point. Despite the complete horse mitochondrial DNA sequence being published in 1994, most studies had focused on genetic information solely from the control region a highly variable region of the mitochondrial genome. If we lay the genome out, you can see just how little of the genome is being considered by only sequencing the control region. It encompasses just 616 base pairs out of the almost 16,000 plus present in the entire genome. This new shift towards sequencing complete genome sequences made it possible to investigate domestication at a high resolution. Achille ended up identifying 667 sites of mutation across all 83 genomes, or haplotypes in other words. She then used a parsimony approach to create a phylogenetic tree that examined the interrelationships of each haplotype. A parsimony approach to phylogeny is simple. It's about choosing which path of genetic divergence had the greatest likelihood of occurring, usually those with the least number of mutations along the way. The result is that the 83 genomes were sorted into 18 major haplogroups, many of which were not identified by the previous studies which had used data solely from the control region. So why are haplogroups so important? You may already be familiar with them from freely available ancestry DNA tests like 23andMe. They are simplified groupings of genetic differences that differentiate one genetic lineage from another. These haplogroups have continuing relevance for explaining where horses were domesticated. For instance, Achille identified that the haplogroups A, G, and Q saw frequency peaks among populations in Asia, with declining frequency in the Middle East and then to Europe. Using this, we can reasonably infer that these lines came from Asia. Nevertheless, samples from all over Eurasia displayed a wide range of haplogroups. This absence of a strong phylogeographic structure established a continuing problem for the study of animal domestication. These animals' involvements in human activity led to large-scale dispersals and intermixing of populations at a greater frequency than you would see in the wild. Studies since 2012 have learned from this by no longer assuming reproductive isolation and considering gene flow from wild animals. So we've obtained a better idea of the where of horse domestication. How did Achille go about figuring out when it took place? To determine the timeline for these genetic divergencies, and therein identify how far back the domesticated horse's last common ancestor was, the study established something called the molecular clock. This involves calibrating our tree with a known genetic ancestor with a known point of divergence. In Achille's case, this was a donkey mitochondrial genome, which bifurcated from the horse's genetic lineage approximately 2 million years ago. Using this, we can translate genetic difference into time, and extrapolating on this data, Achille was able to determine that the most recent common ancestor of horse lineages was 140,000 years ago. Unfortunately, there are limitations to this approach. Firstly, the more genetically distinct two haplotypes are, the more likely mutations are to double up and obscure the true relationship between the two. This is termed saturation. Additionally, mutations in the first and second base pair in a reading frame have a higher likelihood of resulting in non-synonymous mutations, leading often to deleterious phenotypes. 
This means that most mutations get obscured in phylogenetic studies to purifying selection, although this effect is seen less in younger haplotypes. Assuming a linear rate of mutation, therefore, may not be the most ideal scenario. Nevertheless, Achilles' work has continuing relevance for the study of animal domestication. Perhaps the most interesting, however, is that this picture of how horses developed over time implicitly paints a picture of human history alongside them.